I'm Jim Rogers, professor at Oklahoma State University, but primarily today I'm a baseball fan and I'm excited about joining you as we look, take a look at the Oklahoma State University Cowboys and the tremendous achievements that they've achieved this past 10 years. We can take a look at uh, hitting for power and average. As you look at the Cowboys, they've accomplished some goals that many other teams would be envious of. 1985, Pete and Cavilla, an All-American outfielder for the Cowboys, set an NCAA record NCAA record for 48 home runs in one season. And last year, take a look at Robin Ventura, College Player of the Year, set a record for hitting in consecutive games 58 safe times. Today, we have with us Coach Gary Ward, 507 victories in the last 10 years. I'm sure there are a lot of other coaches around would love to have that kind of record. It's going to show us and give us a little insight as to what the Cowboys do to achieve these records. Coach Ward, we're looking forward to a great day today. We're going to have some fun, Jim. We'd like to uh, move over here to where we can get into more of a situation where we can start to talk a little bit of baseball with you. Welcome to you from uh, about Washington to New Hampshire and I think North Dakota to New Mexico. And a special welcome to uh, the Oregonians at Klamath Falls from uh, Randy Whistler, who is now my assistant coach here at Oklahoma State. Let's get into the hitting action. We're going to get a little bit animated and excited with you. Uh, first of all, the difficulty is to define what the hitting stroke is. It's very critical to that. And you might throw out 10 or 12 different definitions, but primarily hitting is the sequential unlocking of body parts to maximize bat speed at the point of contact. Now that sounds a little bit complex at times, but you have to understand the body as a gear. Uh, liken it to a five-speed Toyota. Uh, each gear is going to increase in speed until you reach road speed. And road speed is where the bat passes through the zone right here. We refer to this later on as let the bat travel. From that standpoint, uh, the bat speed at the point of contact is the key ingredient when you start talking about velocity of the bat or velocity of the ball when it leaves the bat. You can put it into a complex term and call that mass times velocity squared. We call that kinetic energy. Well, let's keep it simple from the standpoint that when a bat makes contact with a ball, how fast does the ball leave? It's a composite of speed of the ball and speed of the bat. We get so many hitters who have the problem of stiffening the bat and taking it through the zone. You have to understand a few of the definitions before we can get into the hitting technique. If the bat moves through the zone in a pushing action, we never release the last gear. And so often, this is what kids do. 95% of the people that come to my Mid-America All-Star Baseball camps, and even many of the youngsters who come to Oklahoma State, uh, much like Pete Incavilla, they're going to get their hands into position and when they take a stride action, they immediately do something with their hands to get big. We call this stride separate. And when they separate, they bar the lead arm and then they sweep the bat through the zone. They push it through the zone and therefore it's a slow release and they do not have the third and fourth gear that we're dealing with. A third and fourth gear in a Toyota in a good Toyota motor car is going to run out there pretty fast, isn't it? Well, this is a missing link and this is what we want you to understand. Sequential unlocking is unlocking in order. It's from the ground up. All right. First thing that happens in hitting is we take a striding action. So as we get into the batter's box, we get ready to move, we've got to take a striding action. What is the purpose of the stride? It's the purpose of getting the body in motion. It's all it's preferred to do. All we want it to do is number one preferred item is to get the body in no motion. Sometimes we'll call that overcoming inertia. Well, again, it's a big term. Suffice it to say, when the body moves, the stride action will let it move. What does the stride do? Now we get a little more technical. We take a striding action. Does it take me forward? Does it take me down? What does it make my body feel like? And this is really the critical issue. The striding action is for the purpose of getting movement. We have reemphasized that three times now. At the same time, it's going to load and lower the body. In this particular area of the body, we want to maintain power and tension. At the conclusion of the power base, which is the distance between my feet, right here, the length of the bat that I use and the distance between my feet should be approximately the same. Anything greater than that, I'm getting too wide and I'm losing power. We refer to the position of the feet after the striding action as the power base. The stride's going to take me down into my legs. Now, all power in hitting emanates from mid-thigh through low back. We get into the low back area through here. We have great power in here. We have to collect the power in this particular area. 
That's the purpose of the stride, to maintain perfect balance. Young players really have a difficult time with balance. So all of us as baseball players should take upon ourselves to use agility drills like the jump rope continually. The jump rope's a great balance exercise. It's a forgotten drill. Basically, when we move, does it take me out of balance? So many hitters, when they move on the stride, will fall forward, take their nose to the plate. They will move forward, take all their power base and move it to the plate too early before they're ready to use it. Or they come up high in their legs. The striding action pushes them up. We get a push-up action out of here. Get it in your mind that you stride to a power base and you stay in your legs. You actually feel the power gathered in your legs and low back. Very critical. This power base position, we've often referred to it over the years as a keto. In studying the Japanese arts, most of the defensive arts, karate, kung fu, and etc., are asking you primarily to control energy or centralize energy. So we think of our belly button as the middle of that energy center. We think of it in hitting then in a circle around the belly button. We're saying here is where all power is controlled. So if I'm going to deal with an oncoming attacker, as a martial arts defensive expert, then I want to centralize all my energy. And the second thought in Japanese culture is that we're going to absorb the energy of the oncoming attacker. Now, what else describes hitting any better than that? As I'm setting up and moving to the plate, m primarily I'm moving and absorbing the oncoming energy of the pitch. And I want to centralize energy right here, not in my hands, this is where we get it all the time in our hands. We get stride, separate, bar, and all the energy is controlled up here. This is the power. We've lost it. Once we get the power area out of here or lose our Aikido, and it's one of those terms our kids kind of laugh about, but it's one of those that sticks in their mind. Get to a power base, establish good balance, load the lower body, gather centralized energy, have the feeling of Aikido that I could uh, take on an oncoming attacker. There are a couple of other things I could do at this particular point. To test yourself to see if you're at the proper power base, when you reach this particular point, can you do two things? Could I absorb and catch a 30 or 40 pound weight tossed to me? Maybe a large medicine ball that you used to use in physical education an awful lot. 